Oh, so. but what do you what did you think? <laughs> oh, about the book? Yeah. yeah I, I actually really liked it. Yeah. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I don't know. Maybe it's just the mood I've been in for the past little while, but it actually made me, like, a little bit emotional. Um, I don't know. It's just interesting to think about, like, how much time and effort and love went into creating these beautiful things that now we can easily take for granted, but... I don't know. Yeah. It's just sweet to see how the generations have built upon each other to make more beautiful and functional items. So Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was also cool that like So there's so much like history there that like I feel like I don't know about at all, but it's like, oh, this is a major invention that went alongside like the creation of stone tools or yeah. <laughs> it's like huh. I always just kind of assumed they had like like vines or something. I feel like that's what they always show on like movies. It's like, oh, here's yeah. just a vine cord they just found and they just wrapped the stone head on it. I'm like, oh, I had to make thread. You know? Like, yeah. I just never really thought about it before, and I had a hard time thinking of, like, like oh, these Stone Age people were making th thread. I'm like, can you imagine just, like, a, like our image of, like, a caveman that's in movies being like, yes, making thread. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know, the wish it was, like, really dumb, like, hammer, rock, and it's just, like, not, I have a hard time imagining that. <laughs> I, get, I mean, I definitely get that because it's hard to sort of like break out of, I guess how we're sort of conditioned is that people who lived in olden times are dumb. Yeah. They're not like us, you know. Well, they are computers. <laughs> yeah, but it, if you really stop and think about it, it's like we're probably more similar than maybe we're comfortable admitting yeah. to people even just like 20 years ago. And like Neanderthal, it, you yeah. know, that's like cinnamon for like being dumb. But yep. it's like, <laughs> oh, they had inventions and like discovery. Which is funny because like it had to start somewhere. So would yeah. it make sense that it started with like our earliest ancestors <laughs> instead of just like, I don't know, popping out of the sky one day? One day we became smart. <laughs> one day. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it took, just one day. Yeah. People who study evolution would be very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So, uh, one of the parts of the book that I thought was like extra fascinating was about the work with like silkworms and how um, I guess maybe you were more aware of how cooperative like human survival was with animals whenever you were literally babysitting silkworms for like yeah. years at a time. Which, the lengths that they went to, just to make something pretty and nice, it, no wonder it was so expensive. <laughs> and how much that impact just like, modern medicine? Yeah. That, like, that was, like, the precursor to germ theory, basically. It was, like, fungal infections in silkworms. Which is weird to think about, because, I mean, I feel like we get one story, and a lot of people like to be like, oh, this person, you know, was just brilliant. Like, they just had this flash of insight and... No one had ever thought of it before, and honestly, if you look at like science and really any history, it's built upon other things, and people sort of like to leave that out of the story because it's more fun to hear about someone being brilliant and coming up with yeah. something like, right away. So, watch the slow building of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a little hard to make a movie out of. Can you imagine if they tried to do that? What was that yeah. Eddie Redmayne movie where he's like? I don't know Theory of everything, I think. Yeah, can you imagine if they were like, and here's the hundreds of years of science <laughs> that led to this person being able to do this. I can play Stephen Hawking, so. <laughs> oh, also, like, I don't think I realized, like, how interconnected the different, like, regions and cultures already were. Yeah. Because, like, right, we hear about now, it's like, oh, how global everything is right now. And, like, yeah, yeah we sure for sure are more, because, like, internet and flying. It's a lot faster, for but, sure. But, like, just the amount of, like, oh, there was a major connection between like Japanese silk or silkworm production and then like American based silk making and like oh when the you know you buy Japanese worms and like all the like what was it English or like, European moth raising areas? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like I did not realize how interconnected it already was at that stage. Yeah. You don't really get to hear about the knowledge spread as much. And I don't know if that's just because it's hard to track. Because, yeah. like, I guess maybe it's one of those things where it's like hindsight. Like, oh, we can see the trend and we know that ships were coming from this place to this place or that people were traveling from this area to this area. And so they spread that knowledge, but it's not necessarily like someone wrote down, Fred brought back this cool yeah. new way to do things with worms. Oh, like, who knew? <laughs> yeah, like that one fiber of cotton that was too far north. It was just like, 
I guess they could grow it here. Shrug, like. <laughs> yeah, like. Uh, but we don't know. Like, we had no evidence that they had done that. We don't know how they did that. And I guess they don't currently do it, or else it wouldn't be that surprising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, it started 20 years ago, and then never happened again. Yeah. That's pretty weird. I guess I don't envy uh, historians having to figure out a lot of these details through, like, second to third hand resources. I, I guess maybe the scientific mindset is, like, we test it now. <laughs> we know it now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but the historian thing, like, it seems like you need such specialized knowledge to be able to understand anything. Like, like having that one guy who found, like, what was it, Mycia? And he's like, oh, this is the tower symbol. And it took someone else being like, that's a loom. Or something like, <laughs> yeah, that's like that's fiber. You're reading or something. it upside down or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and like I, I'd seen that like in a different book too, where it was like, oh, there's this tool. I don't know what it does. And then this leather worker guy was like, yeah, you, we use that now. You scrape leather or something with it. And it's like, like to know to be able to figure out history, you have to already be an expert in the thing that you don't know what it's about. Yeah, to be able to figure out. What it is. But you have to remain flexible too. Yeah, I feel like some people they're like, this is what I was taught, therefore. It is the only right answer. Yeah. <laughs> if you see anything else, then it's just a lie. <laughs> and you're bad at your job. So <laughs> yeah. it's good to have people who are willing to be like, oh, I learned it this way, but maybe I was wrong. Yeah. And even though I'm an expert in this, I'm willing to let that knowledge evolve. Yeah, like the cotton guy. I was like, oh, I guess it is cotton. Yeah. <laughs> that far north. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and like... I think one of my favorite parts of, that, of the chapter one was the, uh, like, how cotton, the American cotton came to be. And it's like, oh, we have these two dominant theories. And it's like, oh, they're both wrong. <laughs> and we have no idea yeah. <laughs> how, how that happened. That single time where it was like, oh, this is like, one time the American, like, the African version of cotton somehow crossed over to America and bred a single time with the local cotton. And then that's how we have all this great cotton. I feel like it's crazy. Well, and it, some part of me wants to assign, like, intentionality to some of these things that have happened. Like, I want to be like, there was a person who was on a ship and they had these seeds. And they were like, once I get to this new place, I'm going to plant these here. You know, like, yeah. I, I want to make it a story, but it could be as simple as, like, somebody brought a bird. <laughs> yeah. And he, like, pooped in the right place. <laughs> well, that one, wasn't that one, like, they determined as, like, way before humans existed? Which is crazy. Right? Yeah. I don't know, it's just crazy to think about the amount of things that have to go right for the world to exist as it does for us. Yeah. Yeah. Like, imagine if that one thing, like, wasn't there two different circumstances that had it happen, like, exactly once? Really close, yeah. I don't know what the first one was, though, but, like, like without those very specific rare things happening, we just wouldn't have cotton. And yeah. then, would you, we all just be wearing linen? Like, <laughs> or would we, I don't or know. Would we just staple them? Well, and that's why it's always interesting when someone just like, oh, this is like the purest form of this, because it's like, well, it may not be the purest form of this, it's just the one that like, we found the most useful, so we kept yeah. it around, we kept doing it, um, but I don't know, maybe there's more information out there that I'm just not aware of that like, explains why cotton is a particular way, beyond just this book. Yeah, so. One advantage of reading it over me having done the audible is like all the pictures. Oh, yes. <laughs> and like the picture of the sheep, like the closest version to the ancient sheep that we have. I was like, wow, that. <laughs> Where was that one? Oh yeah, the cotton examples. Like, oh, that's the the largest like AD one, and that's just an A one. It's like, wow, that's like <laughs> they're completely different. Yeah, yields. yeah. Wow, you underline. I was trying to remember it. I kept reading things and not remembering things like, if I underline it, it's important. <laughs> but like, I just love the pictures they had yeah. of like that little scraggly, like, molting sheep and then it's like, today's sheep. <laughs> well, and exactly, like, if we're going with like, whatever the most, like, common form of sheep is nowadays, we would look at that image. But if yeah. we're thinking like a hundred years ago, it's the scraggly sheep that looks really sad. <laughs> well, what did they say it was like? kind of got to that version and like they knew by like Greece because that's the kind depicted in like the Mycenaean like pictures like how how modern that is in comparison because we already had a lot of our major like agricultural inventions by that point so that's actually relatively very modern but it seems like so long ago oh yeah that it's just like basically basically mythos by now <laughs> <laughs> well and sometimes I kind of like jokingly to myself will be like maybe back in the day they were like we're gonna paint 
our sheep to look like the prettiest, best sheep. Like, it's the Instagram filter of <laughs> however long ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, one thing that I like is when they did bring it into modern day and they were talking about uh, new methods to make materials and how sometimes they just don't really work out. Yeah. Um, like all the ones that just dropped off? Yeah. What was that one during, like, one of the war? Like, in World War, the something? Italian one. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of it, and I can't remember. Was that a new fiber altogether that like people just didn't like? I think so. Yeah, because they made things like rayon, which obviously stuck around. Yeah, but uh, lanitol. Yeah, Is that I think. That the one? Yeah, because it's not a thing that we use now. No, and I. The one that smelled like it was like milk protein or something. Yeah. So it smelled like cheese and it got like wet or something. Yeah. <laughs> so I can definitely see why people are like, you know, maybe not. So I, <laughs> it makes me wonder about all the things that failed along the way that we just don't really have evidence yeah. for anymore. Because obviously fiber is one of the things that doesn't stick around. The only reason they were able to determine, like you mentioned before, that there was thread of sorts that held those. Oh, like the tiny microscopic little bits of thread. Exactly. Like the one curly Q. And yeah. And it's it's crazy that even that much, though, stuck around after that long. Yeah. Like, that's crazy to me that, like, a little bit of cotton thread stuck around, like, I don't even remember how long it was since Stone Age. Well, and that's uh, one of the things that the book brought up that I hadn't really thought about. I don't remember if this is explicitly in the first chapter or if in the introduction, mm. where they were talking about the common use of, like, you know, if you go online, you can read down on, like, a thread, like a Reddit thread yeah, or something, like you know? Yeah, like, the, all the places in, like, normal vocabulary it is. Yeah, because it's so important to human civilization, we don't even think about all the ways that it gets used in just everyday speech. Yeah. Which is cool. <laughs> oh, was it in the purpose of chapter one that had the... I think chapter one that had like the pictures of like the first was it like Dutch? I'm looking people. Yeah, I think it's the very beginning of chapter oh. one. Where they had like the, oh, the, the No the uh The labor <laughs> that's oh, being outsourced it? to like pigs or something. I can't remember. Oh, was this my shoe in chapter two? But no. Oh, maybe that was chapter two. <gasps> you beat the head. Was I cheating? Ooh. What's the one with? Uh, this is the one I thought. Threads you were chapter about. two, yeah. Um, chapter two. So that's a, that's a. What is it? Like a hint? What is the? A spoiler? No, not spoiler. What's the thing <laughs> where it's like, oh, just for, like to get you to go to the next chapter? Like, oh, okay. We're foreshadowing. Yeah, it's foreshadowing. <laughs> We're foreshadowing a chapter of a book that you could easily pick up yourself and read. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind then. That's okay. Well, I thought you were talking about the one where the woman was outsourcing all her labor to boars <laughs> or oh, yeah. pigs or something. Oh, with like, oh yeah, with making linen. Yeah. Well, and like flaxseed is still something that you can cook with. Like, yeah, but I guess it's, I didn't know that it was different. It is. I didn't know yeah. it was a different. I thought it was the same thing until they're like, oh, then we grew one to be oil and the other one to be <laughs> fiber. And I was like, yeah. oh. Hmm. But it's impressive how much ingenuity, I guess, is on this really like, human ingenuity. We can't assign a name to the people who did these things, or if it was done over generations, or, you know, really, there's not a lot of way to track down who did it, but we benefit from it, you know, hundreds, thousands of yeah. years since. Like, it's kind of cool. <laughs> I would love to see how they, like, how exactly that was discovered. Because, like, it makes sense the way the book thought. We're like, oh, it's just rotting, you see the fibers, and... Eventually, you just experiment and you get it a little bit better. But somebody still had to be the first. Yeah. And usually someone who's the first at something is like, I'm going to eat these berries in the woods, and then they're the one that dies. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, it's interesting that it worked out for some. <laughs> I think, oh, what was it? Nathan was watching a Swedish YouTuber, I think. Ooh. Who I think, what did he, did he either grew hemp or not hemp, but like, was it was it flax? Or flax. Norway? No. Okay. Flax. All right. So yeah, so Torborn Uma. He grew flax in like this little little section what? and like made tools specifically for like stripping the seeds off of it and like all the specialized tools he had to make in order to process the flax into like 
make a rope? Is his end goal to make a rope? Okay, we don't know what he, he does wants. a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's really there's a lot of work. Fascinating. Yeah, I don't. I don't envy him that project, because I think unless you're really passionate about it, or you really, really need it, there's no reason for you to go to that trouble. Yeah, and it was just like this that. little side thing he just did, and he's just making all these specialized tools for processing it. <laughs> it's funny, I've seen a hackle before, and I don't think I knew what it was used for. <laughs> so that's good to know. And I think this book goes all the way to like very modern day like things that are currently in development. Which, yes, at the end of chapter yeah. one. <laughs> I really like Spider-Man, <laughs> so I got very excited they were talking about synthetic spider silk. Obviously, I know it's not one and the same, but still, it, yeah. it made my spidey sense go off, if you will. <laughs> it yeah. made me really happy. So I um, ended up looking up that startup. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and they do a lot more than that, which I think the book even alludes to, but it does seem like uh, being able to synthetically manufacture the spider silk is like their bread and butter. Like, yeah. that's what keeps them going. So. It's pretty cool. I hope things work out for them. It's not a big team. There's like eight people. <laughs> well, because when was this book published? Oh. Like, how long has it been since you wrote about them? Good question. First edition, December 2020. So, this is fairly recent, you know. But the first paperback edition was December 2021. 2020 both seems a lot more recent. And a lot for like <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I know it's 2023, but it's still kind of a little bit feels like 2020. Yeah. I don't know how. Uh, I know that time has passed. I was there for it. But... It kind of still feels like we're still in COVID, to be honest. And it's like, well, that 2020 is when COVID happened, and COVID's kind of happening still. It is. So we're in 2020. <laughs> oh. That's like... how time works. <laughs> Where is it? I'm convinced I don't know where anything is in this book. <laughs> Because this is talking about, like, cotton being further north than they expected. I was so impressed when it was like, oh, and it, like, got an extra pair of chromosomes from the parent. I was like, oh, that's so impressive. I was like, that's really common plants. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. I guess. I am very impressed by how connected Europe and Asia just was connected just throughout history. And then there was, like, Americas. And it was just completely separate. I don't know, like something about like how connected it is. Because you kind of think, because I feel like we learn about each geography's history separately. It's like, oh, we're going to yeah. do Asian history, doing European history. And I feel like we don't often get the picture of how everything is connected and like, mm -hmm. oh, this thing was discovered in China, so it moved to then, like, slowly moved to like the Middle East and then Europe and then. I don't know. I think that's kind of a function of how we learn things in school. Yeah. Like, uh, they really go out of their way to divide subjects when possible. Like, you're learning about science right now, you're learning about math right now, you're learning about history, yeah. you're learning about blah, 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 blah. And in some ways that's helpful because you are, like, limiting the scope of yeah. what you have to cover in a class, but I also think it deceives you into thinking those limits are, are like, are artificial. Yeah. yeah. And, which is unfortunate, because it'd be cool if you could go to, like, a science class and then they would teach you something, like, in science that corresponds to something you're learning in history. So like, yeah. oh, this is how a television works and you're learning about the 50s or something. Yeah. You know, like, I think that would be a better way to do things, maybe. Because it does really feel like every time you think about history, you think about like very segmented portions of life. And while that can be helpful, I think sometimes it's a little more helpful to look at things as a whole more than we're really taught to do, I guess. Yeah not making my point very well, but it's off the cuff, so. <laughs> no, I kind of agree, like, because, like, you know, when you do programming, then we'll learn about, like, Aiden Lovelace and, like, yeah. Uh, well, like, but it's usually just sort of, like, like yeah, oh, this might be a question some fun on your facts. Test, but we won't talk about why, like, this movement was important to this technology, or this technology yeah. made this movement. Like, you don't really think about how symbiotic everything is, I guess. And it kind of seems like it's mainly, like, in history class, like, mainly history of wars. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I took a war world history class, and I was like, oh, Genghis Khan, and, like, I don't know, just stuff like that, like, like huge conquerors and stuff, and it's not like... This is when the silkworm was discovered, and then they do. <laughs> I wonder if that's because it's just like 
it's not easy, obviously, but it's just like a good place to draw a line. Yeah. And be like, okay, now we're in a war, and then a lot of innovation usually comes out of conflict. Because you have not only like different cultures meeting, but also you have a lot of need. Yeah. Out of like, oh, we need things to help people stop bleeding. We need things to, you know, like. Yeah. It's a lot more gradual when there's not an immediate reason. <laughs> 50,000 men are dying. What are we going to do about that? <laughs> I'm like, I guess. I mean, war impacts it too. Yeah, because, like, I don't know if it was this book or a different book. <laughs> they brought up the, like, I think it was King Scott. I don't know, but one of the big kings or something. Like, while they conquered, part of them conquering was finding people who were good at making textiles and then bringing them all together. Yeah. And it was, like, this huge center for, like, textile making because they had people from all across, like, Eurasia mm -hmm. all together and combining the different cultural traditions yeah. of fiber making and, like, Sharing textiles. Their skills. Yeah. And that was apparently really, like, just a very unique combination of, like, the best people from around Eurasia. And you don't Probably get to necessarily Eurasia, yeah. see that a lot, especially because a lot of people weren't able to go more than, like, a mile yeah. outside of their town, which, you know, like, I get it, but <laughs> it's kind of crazy to think about how much is just sort of happenstance and because someone thought it would be a good idea. Like, yeah. they had no reason to think, oh yes, this will move civilization forward. It was just, now let's just get all these people who are good at this together and see what happens. <laughs> I wonder how much more you used to be able to tell about a person based on what from. they were wearing. Oh. Like, because, you know, that, that one chapter was like, oh, like, you know, the Islamic people were like linen for the, these cultural reasons. And I wonder how much of that was like, oh, you could tell this person's from this area because they wore, like, wool and in this kind of cut. Since they didn't change clothing very often, I wonder. Like, more like cotton. Oh, above? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Wearing cotton became a mark, so I got it wrong. I, I, said, I said linen, but this is cotton. Ah, okay. I'm not gonna fault you, because <laughs> I couldn't remember particularly either. Oh, it was because it was about silks. Islam promised the faithful silks in heaven, but forbade them to Muslim men in this world. And wearing cotton became a mark of devotion. And so the demand for cotton grew with each new convert. Which is why... They... Oh, or linen in Egypt. So plain yeah. white cotton or linen in Egypt signals sincere Islam and marked its wearer as one who shared its in the aesthetic of the conquering Arabs. Which is probably why the next paragraph, where they're talking about how they modified the land to make it possible to yeah. grow the things necessary, so like, because more people needed it, that brought up prices, and because more people were like, oh, I can totally grow this, then yeah. it sort of like that If that what hadn't <laughs> been a part of the religion, I wonder if silk would have been a lot, would be a lot bigger today. I don't, it is. Well, there's still a lot more constraints on yeah. silk production, especially back then, than linen or but cotton. But, like, with that being such a driver for cotton, I just wonder if, like, it Maybe would have felt that way just because of other cultural things. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be fun to, like, see an alternate history just from that. Like, you can have silks on Earth, too, and then see where that took people. Yeah, because it says... By the 10th century AD, cotton was growing, found growing in nearly every region of the Muslim world from Mesopotamia to Syria to Asia Minor, and from Egypt to Maghreb? I'm gonna trust you. To Spain? I don't, yeah, I don't know what that word is, but... <laughs> I mean, again, the only thing that I would see standing in the way is it's living creatures producing. Yeah. Thing. And like obviously plants are living too, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's a point. Slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends whether or not mulberry grows easier than yeah. Because I don't really know much about how mulberries grow. So I'm glad you're enjoying the book though. Like, because I I really like it. I don't know anyone else that would be into it yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Who would even try and read it? <laughs> I mean, I definitely will say it's like outside of my norm because I, I just end up reading fiction more yeah. than I necessarily read nonfiction. Same. But I'm glad I've read it so far, at least. On to chapter two. Yeah. Just gotta keep chugging along. So. And from the little bit I accidentally read, it's pretty. <laughs> yeah. Sneaking ahead, reading Lots all the chapters. Lots of very interesting points I underlined in chapter two. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, your dog is adorable. Oh my gosh, she's cute. I like that big old stretch. Just higher body <laughs> goes into it. You know, my favorite part of the podcast is the dead air. <laughs> I just realized we hadn't talked for like a minute. Oh, we'll cut man. it out. Okay, good. <laughs>